As we saw last week, Abraham had obviously taught his son Isaac that he had every reason to trust that the Lord would fulfil his promises. No matter, no matter how improbable they might have looked from a human perspective, the Lord was able to do as he'd said. You can easily imagine I, I, Abraham and Isaac lying down under the stars as he recounts some of the highs and lows of his walk with the Lord. Okay, Isaac, lesson one. Your mum was well old when we received the promises and, and she was an awful lot older when we had you. In the meantime, we thought it was impossible for her to have kids. So uh, she, she'd never been able to uh, and, and was physically incapable of having them by this time in her life. So me and your mum decided I should sleep with our servant, uh, servant Hagar, to fulfil God's promises of a child. And hey presto, your brother Ishmael appeared on the scene. Now, yeah, you don't do things like that. That was a bad move, Isaac. You know how much heartache I've suffered for that ungodly decision over the years. And last week we saw that Isaac had learnt this lesson well from his father. Unlike Abraham, Isaac's wait, uh, Isaac uh, waited uh, for the Lord and his wait was, was filled with faith during those 20 years. Instead of trying to do uh, God's work for him, he waited patiently and prayerfully and trusted that God has got this. He's not going to let his plans and promises fail. So far, so good. Lesson one, tick. This week, we get another insight into Abraham and Isaac's fireside heart to hearts. Again, we can picture the scene as Abraham goes on, digging up his past for examples of, of how not to live as the carrier of God's promises, uh, uh, of gospel blessing. Okay, Isaac, lesson two. This is how not to be the gospel blessing to the nations you were called to be. Another time, uh, well, from the outset of God calling us, actually, me and your mum had this harebrained agreement that she should she should revert to being my sister any time we travelled, so that so that in exchange for her, I might get the provision and protection I wanted in those places. Again, much shame in that decision, mate. Don't do such wicked things. The Lord is your shield and your very great reward. He will protect you and provide for you no matter where, uh, where you go and what life may throw at you. I've left the gospel smouldering in a heap in a number of places in my life and the Lord's had to clean up after me. Those times were unfortunate, unnecessary and ultimately embarrassing, my son. Abimelech and, and the commander of his forces, Foucault, uh, showed me uh, right up in the godly way they treated me after I brought God's curse rather than his blessing upon their land. Over the years, the Lord and his angel have moved heaven and earth time and again to be with me, to reassure me and to prove to me that nothing is impossible with him. Do you know your, your old man even kicked the butt of four kings one time because the, the Lord, Lord delivered them into my hand? <laughs> Those were the days. He even went so far as to promise his own life that he wouldn't let his promises fail. The Lord has given me every reason to trust in him every step of the way and to walk according to that faith. Again, mate, save yourself the pain and the shame. Take it from me. He's got this and he won't let you down. Right, well, we've got the fire. Uh, did you bring the lamb for the sacrifice tonight, lad? Just kidding. But seriously, remember that the Lord will provide. One day that devil crush is going to come and he's going to deal with our sin once and for all. All you've got to do is keep looking to him, keep pointing to him, and the rest is in the Lord's hands. It's just a picture of what a heart to heart might have looked like between Abraham and Isaac there. And last week we saw how, uh, saw how Isaac fulfilled lesson one beautifully, didn't we? He waited patiently for the Lord to provide him with that child. 
This week we're going to see how we got on with lesson two. How is he going to get on with being the gospel blessing to the nations that he's been called to be? Let me remind you of of what it says there in verse one. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Well, the stage is set perfectly for Isaac here. Another famine in Canaan, another husband and wife trip to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The difference is that that the Lord appeared to him in person at the outset of these unsettling and potentially faith rocking circumstances. The second person of the Trinity wanted to reassure him of his presence with him and that his promises would be fulfilled through him. He also reminds him of his responsibility to be the gospel blessing that he's been called to be in that place. Now, whilst Abraham may well have gone out of his way in a way that we've just thought about to teach his son to learn from his mistakes, the Lord actually speaks incredibly highly of him. He might have left some bad examples for Isaac, but the Lord wants Isaac to remember the positive lessons that his father has left for him as he goes on into this place. Yes, Abraham was was up up and down in his walk with the Lord, but he, he often acted with faith and obedience that God had given him good reason uh, to have. Isaac's therefore going into Gerar uh, with this twofold picture of his father's uh, wonky walk in his mind. He was at one and the same time the father of faith and the chief of sinners. So what's Isaac going to do now? How's he going to respond to this potentially scary land where he might be persecuted? Is he going to walk the well-trodden path of fear? Or is he going to walk before the Lord in faith? Sadly, Isaac chooses to recycle his dad's very bad idea and foolishly copies his strategy because he was afraid, like Abraham had been, that the men of that place might kill him to steal his beautiful wife. He said that she was his sister. Now, that's a pretty unimaginative thing for him to say, isn't it? I mean, it was no excuse the first time, but at least Sarah was Abraham's half sister. And so Isaac actively avoided the persecution he might well have faced in Gerar. He not only shelved his calling to be the gospel blessing that he was called to be, he was also willing to give up his wife to another man so that he might not be treated badly. When Isaac and Rebecca's flirting and canoodling made it abundantly clear that they were more than just friends, Abimelech slams Isaac with the same questions that his father had been. What have you done and why have you done it? He must have been thinking, what is it with these supposedly faith-filled people who walk around doing such faithless things all the time? Isaac explains that he took the action that he did because basically he considered the men of Gerar to be a bunch of godless Neanderthals. Just like with Abraham, Abimelech's answer would have knocked Isaac right off of his moral high horse. One of my men might have slept with your wife and and you would have brought that guilt upon us. Abimelech shows that there is a fear of God in that place and that if any of his men had sinned by sleeping with Rebecca it would have been Isaac's fault instead of retaliating he ordered his men to leave Isaac and Rebecca well alone after that after that tremendous fall in 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 an act of apparent repentance Isaac ready now to live for the Lord in that land whether he suffers for it or not puts down roots in Gerar as God had told him to. He shows that he's planning on staying there until further notice from God by planting crops. And in in a totally unexpected twist, the Lord starts to pour out his blessing upon him uh, in a heap of undeserved grace. 
on top of the mercy that he'd already received from Abimelech. The Lord blessed Isaac so much that his crop reached 100 fold and he became very wealthy. This all happened in in the same year that Isaac had mistreated Abimelech and insulted his nation so badly. And obviously that was still quite a bit raw for them. And they found uh, God's abundant blessing of Isaac quite hard to swallow. His wealth was a massive problem for the Philistines. It must have made them question, how could God treat Isaac so well after he'd failed him so badly and after he treated us so badly as well? They knew that Isaac really deserved God's punishment and not his blessing. But what they also needed to know was that that was exactly the same for them as well. They also deserved God's punishment rather than his blessing. And just as Isaac had done, they need to recognise their sin and turn to God for his forgiveness. The Philistines knew of the Lord. He'd been at work uh, among them through both Abraham and Isaac. Yes, they'd both made mistakes among them, but the Lord had still left them with a clear understanding of his grace and of their responsibility to hold on to the gospel promise for salvation. The undeserved grace that the Lord had shown to Isaac should have given the Philistines a hope for themselves and a desire for the same kind of grace. The sad thing is that they decided not to join the Lord's people in holding on to the promise. Now, I I don't know, maybe you've been around the church long enough to know that it's full of sinners who don't deserve God's goodness to them. If you don't realise that, then, then stick around here at BEC for a little while or any other church long enough, and you soon will. But you'll also realise that everyone in the church is ready to put their hand up to that. They're all self-professing sinners, people who realise that they don't deserve anything good from God whatsoever. None of them would want to show off their own goodness to you but they would want to show off the goodness of Jesus. The church is full of people who realise that they aren't good enough for God. But it's full of people that have also come to understand that Jesus is. Jesus came into this world and he lived a perfect life before God. And when he died, he died the death that our sin deserves. And three days later, he defeated death by rising from the grave, never to die again. And you know what? He did all of that for you. He lived the perfect life that's impossible for you to live. He died the death that you deserve for your sin. And he rose from death so that he could give you new and eternal life as well the question is will you receive that from him will you join the the self-professing sinners club that is the church and cling for dear life to its savior if unlike the philistines your answer to that is yes then come to jesus now thank him for all that he's done for you Ask him to forgive you for all of your sin. Ask him to give you that new and eternal life with God that you don't deserve either. If you turn to him now in prayer and ask him to do those things for you, then do you know what? He'll do that. Instantly you'll be forgiven for all that you've ever done wrong and you'll enter into a new and beautiful relationship with your creator that will start now and that will last for eternity. The sad thing in this passage is that the Philistines never chose to do that. Instead of trusting in Isaac's saviour, they chose to oppose him and to persecute him. Instead of seeking the same grace that Isaac had received, they they pushed him away. And they did all they could to get him as far as away from him as they could. They're so jealous of him that they cannot bear to see the Lord's blessing of him any longer. 
So they smoke him out by filling up the wells that Abraham had dug. Abimelech, a little bit more politely than that, then asks Isaac to move away because he's become too powerful. And Isaac, wanting to keep the peace, uh, does as he's asked and he moves out uh, into the valley. They continue to harass Isaac there by stealing from him the wells that he dug, depriving him, uh, the people with him and his vast livestock from the essential water that they need. Water of life in that climate. Without it, they, they all would have died. In response, Isaac just packed up and he moved on uh, to the next place. The life and experience of of Isaac here once again points us forward to the time of Christ. We've already seen the life of Christ pictured in his servant Isaac, haven't we? As he he carried that word of, of sacrifice on his back up the same hill that Jesus one day would. This time though, Christ can be seen through the meekness of Isaac as he suffers at the hands of his persecutors. It says in 1 Peter, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. When they heard their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted in himself to him who judges justly. Jesus bore the insults of his enemies to the extent that he actually took their sin. And he died for its consequences on the cross so that they might find peace and forgiveness with God. Isaac, reflecting his saviour, bore the persecution which at first he so desperately avoided. His priority uh, now was not to get in the way of the calling that he'd been he'd been called to be uh, 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 being that gospel blessing to the nations finally in in verse 22 isaac and his people's needs are met when no one attempts to steal this newly dug well from him and once the lord had provided for it for him uh, a place uh, in that way uh, he met with him in person again to encourage him in the persecution that he was facing for his sake Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Isaac responds to the Lord's faithfulness by calling upon his name and by building an altar upon which he can offer those acceptable sacrifices that we've seen all the way back through Genesis now. The Lord goes on in verse 26 uh, to make sure that Isaac has the protection that he needed. Abimelech seeks him out and pretty much apologises to him. Seeing that the Lord was clearly with Isaac, he wants an agreement of peace with him. Isaac's not not only ready to to forgive Abimelech and enter into uh, this peace treaty, He extends a a friend, a hand of of friendship, I should say, to him by welcoming him to his table and putting on this lavish feast uh, for him. Now, this was an incredibly generous thing for Isaac to do as Abimelech had essentially made an enemy of him. But Isaac didn't want to repay evil for evil. Again, he was living out the life of Christ in his actions here. Romans 12 says, if it's possible, as much as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Of course, that that verse applies to us as much as Isaac, as we're also called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus as we live before him in this world. Now, it's illegal for us to be treated in the same way as Isaac was in this passage. The worst forms of persecution that we might face is, I don't know, something like getting a bit of stick for our faith, or maybe we might be avoided. Um, But the question is, are we willing to bear that kind of persecution? Or will we do anything in order to avoid it? Maybe it's a bit scary for you to walk with Jesus sometimes. Maybe in school or at work or amongst friends, social groups or family. 
But, you know, we can be confident as we see in this chapter that God will never lead us into a place of threat or danger and just leave us to our own devices. He says, I will be with you and I will bless you. So let's learn from the example of Isaac that we can trust uh, that promise and we can continue to be the gospel blessing to the nation's that we were called to be. Amen. Let's pray uh, together now. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you and we thank you for this chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 26. We we thank you, Lord, that again, it's, 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 warts and all here uh, laid out before us we see uh, Isaac's failures here that he's walking in the footsteps of his father instead of walking in the footsteps of Jesus as this passage uh, begins and it's sad to see it's sad to see that he makes the same decisions uh, as his father had because of his fear of men because of his fear of persecution but Lord God thank you for how you met with him in that place thank you for how you corrected him and how you put him on the right path once again Thank you that eventually he did trust that you were with him, that you did provide for him. And he was able to uh, bear the insult. He was able to bear the persecution that he received uh, for, 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 um, for, for following you in that place and, and for your presence with him in that place. Thank you, Lord, that he, he is an example for us in the end of what it is uh, to follow you in the face of persecution. Thank you, Lord, that he, he walked in your footsteps in that way. And Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we walk in this world. Help us to trust in that promise that you are with us, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. Lord God, help us to walk in confidence in that knowledge, not to, not to be scared in any way wherever we go uh, of people who might oppose us, who pe- people who might reject Jesus and us. Uh, because they're offended of your goodness to us. Lord, help us just to continue to live for Jesus in those environments and to show them the love of Christ, because we never know who you're working in. We never know who you might save. And Lord, we wish salvation upon our upon upon those who oppose us. So Lord, help us to live for you. Help us to live out uh, your goodness and to live in your goodness in this world so that people might look on and they might think, wow, I need I need God's forgiveness like that. I need God's grace to me in that kind of way. So Lord, help us to walk before you in this world in that way. Amen. Great, well, we're going to sing now. Uh, We're going to sing one song of worship to the Lord, and then we're going to meet on Zoom uh, 10 minutes after that song. Grab a cup of tea or coffee or whatever, and then we'll meet on Zoom uh, 10 minutes after our closing song. See you soon.